Um, my, my one question, and this is for my, my sort of, uh, um, I suppose for the audience as well, it's not just for me, is uh, now when it comes to vocals and mixing vocals, um, that can be a telling part of a song. I wonder if you could give us a breakdown of your vocal chain that you use. Do you have a specific template that you start out with and build from there? Well, the first things first is um, make sure that you use a good microphone. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny because I, I, I actually have um, an Audio Technica 2035, which I don't use that for recording my vocals. I actually use a Bach mic um, okay. for recording my vocals. And um, it's the same mic that uh, Dave Grohl uses. Um, yeah. It's a really great vocal mic for male vocals in particular. It just has a really nice frequency response. It's it just I, I love the sound of it. Um, and then the vocals get recorded and they get put through a distressor. A, a, a very unusual technique, but I love the sound of the distressor compressor. Um, and it's the hardware version of the distressor. Mm -hmm. And it's very subtle not aggressive but it's enough on a soft um i guess a soft clip type level that you feel like it catches the it catches the peaks but it also sort of just it just it sort of just brings up the transients of it just a little bit it's almost giving it a kind of like almost like a harmonic distortion boost i don't know it's hard to describe because i love mm. the distressor i think the distressor is like a phenomenal compressor it's wonderful for drums in particular um, and bass but i use it for for the vocal um to give it a little bit of that compressed bump that i like um mm -hmm. and from then um i use fab filter eq to yeah. uh to just kind of cut some of the low out um and uh i love the mag 2 plugin alliance i love that for like adding a little bit of air frequency the air band frequency but one of the one of the most important things with that chain is my use of reverb because that's that's important to give the spacing uh, you know like in the in the track it's you know because mm -hmm. not all tracks are the same so you've got a different mood I sometimes like to use di like two di two completely different reverbs and combine them together. I like a kind of initial kind of breath reverb that sort of is the initial, and then another reverb that carries the tail um, yeah. to kind of sort of almost diffuse the first reverb and bleed into a longer decay. Um, I did that a lot on Odyssey, actually. You can hear it on Is There Anybody Out There? And real life you can hear that that was a combination of the lexicon 480 reverb and uh, acoustic arts um, reverb as well that that's a wonderful there's a, a preset called temple reverb but it's like that's all you need <laughs> i mean that's <laughs> like it's like a a really glorious long decay uh shimmer digitally sort of sounding reverb because the lexicon's lovely it has that wonderful lushness but the Lexicon 480 tends to have this gorgeous kind of boost of, but then it, it, the, the, the decay cuts off too quick for me. And when it mm. cuts off, even when you increase the decay time, I don't, I don't like the way it does it. It kind of disperses off in, in a very kind of quick, you know, almost like cigarette smoke in, in the air, in the wind. It kind of goes away, not yeah. in the way I like. So I like that initial plosive kind of, attack decay of the of the reverb but i like it to be um buttered with another reverb to kind of help um fuse the two to kind of create a hybrid i've done that i don't know if i would do that again i, I mean uh on odyssey i wanted to use lexicon 80s reverb because that was the reverb that peter gabriel used and phil collins you know they used those reverbs in their vocals mm. and um, but I, you know, I like to try and bring the retro sound that I have into a more modern context. And yeah, yeah. there's certain techniques that maybe at the time they couldn't use because they wouldn't have even considered it. Whereas now it's very easy to, to try that out without being too time consuming. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, that's I also like to use the glue. Um, that's a, a favourite 
compressor plug-in for the end stage maybe you know just a little soft yeah. compression just to glue the the everything together um yeah i don't know it's kind of interchangeable depending on the on the song and the track yeah. maybe my maybe my vocal style will you know change um how i would maybe attack the 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 eq or the the compression certainly or the reverb yeah i mean it's I mean, a lot of it is feeling your way as you go along, mm-hmm. but I also work with um, a couple of people at the end stage to let them hear what my, you know, plaster scene creation is, <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, and then they will say, "Listen, I think the EQ is too harsh here. Let's do this," and you know, they, they uh, you know, I work with them to kind of be the parachute that catches me when my ears are so saturated that I can't hear the mix anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the that's one of the pitfalls of creating your own music. You know, you you get to mix stage and I try to mix as much as I can while composing. Um but obviously, you know, at a certain point when you've heard the thing played back five hundred times, yep. you can't hear the objectivity of the thing anymore and it's very difficult. Um and I think one of the biggest challenges that a musician can face is when someone else steps in and replaces the pieces. And because you're so identified with your version of the track, even though their re kind of calibration of what you've done is right, being able to step back and say, I'm not the correct man here to be able to 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 make the the decision here i'm going to take a little bit of time away from this and just let you do your thing and i'm going to come back in a couple of weeks and then usually that first impression when you hear it again doesn't lie you know you yeah you immediately you're not you're not thinking oh that vocals went quieter you're immediately thinking that vocal feels right in the mix now yeah because that's the thing when you when you're so identified and attached to your version of the demo when someone repositions the vocal, you start to freak out because it's so different. And and also you have to remember at that point, you don't enjoy listening to the music anymore. You're now just fiddling and, and yeah. you're just at splitting hairs and you have to get to a point where you realise the listener is not going to notice this. The listener yeah. is not going to notice that you've, you know, you're pulling this up 0.5 of a decibel or <laughs> that you're panning this two more to the left I mean they, they, at that point you're literally splitting hairs and taking from Peter and giving to Paul I mean it's like you know you're not making a tangible difference that a listener will benefit from and that's what the point yeah. you get to in a mix you know you have to think is this going to benefit the listener at this point yeah I, I totally agree with that and um, it, it, it echoes uh, I did an interview earlier today and it was the same thing and the, the individual I was interviewing said that they would create um, and they would create a demo and then they would set a seven day timer to remind them to go and then check it out um, rather than in that first instant make a decision, have seven days, let it breathe, go away, listen to something else and then come back to it, which I think is pivotal. And also getting the second set of ears as well because as you mentioned there, you can get so lost in in your own music and I think uh, you can almost lose objectivity in a way. and I don't know, maybe get too emotionally attached to the song as well. I think this is this is going back to a conversation I had earlier with another artist. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and going back to your vocal chain there as well, one one um, element that you didn't mention was delay. Mm. What sort of delay you know are you using? Yeah, actually, I do use delay. Um, I use the Sound Toys bundle, and actually, one there's one effect that I actually like that I seem to keep coming back to, and it's on the echo boy and oh, yes. it's, yeah. it's the um i think it's called the f- is it 15 inch like or 15 millisecond delay or whatever it's like and it just instantly gives you that kind of peter gabriel sort of like slap back echo but it's so like you, i pull it back so that it's quite subtle um but i use delay on my my vocals in a few different ways i mean if i'm if i'm using it just to kind of swim swim the vo- swim the reverb if you uh, i guess is one way i use it you know in the, especially in the chorus you know i would turn on the delay maybe for 
in the chorus and and it kind of swims it just lets the the it just lets the vocal kind of swim around a little bit more in the mix it's kind of strange it's more of a subtle effect for ambient sake whereas in other parts of my music with my vocal i would maybe have a delay on a line and i would write in the automation so that yeah. so that you know you have that maybe you know um you know four for an eighth kind of delay just to kind of emphasize a line where there's space between the next line um that's more of a creative effect it's very sort of 80s pop production effect Mm. um but i love echo boy um on sound toys i love comeback kid um yeah, I'm a huge fan of um, Baby Audio stuff. They make pheno- yeah. phenomenal plugins. Oh my goodness, they make such good plugins. Um, another plugin for delay that I really love is um, Echo Melt. That's <laughs> <laughs> that is a beaut. That is great for synthesizers for just adding a certain sparkle charm that makes the synthesizer part cut in the mix a bit more it's a strange one i know churches like to use that effect a lot um, yeah fellow scottish artist but <laughs> um yeah that's uh the, those are the the only delay plugins that i use i, I, I use echo boy primarily um i use echo melt for more zing and then comeback kid i use for somewhere in between all of it it kind of I like Comeback Kid more for a bit more of a sort of spicy type delay, whereas I would use Echo Boy more for a kind of classic delay, if if that yeah. makes sense. Whereas the Comeback Kid more, you know, maybe the delays will filter out, you know, as they as they reach the end of their um, repeats, um, or maybe they've got more of a kind of gramophone sort of effect on on the on, on the delay effect and. It's a bit more creative based, um, but yeah, I, I try to stick with a core group of plugins. Um, the irony about you know when I was talking earlier about using having too many plugins is that mm. I would always <laughs> still gravitate towards the ones that I was my you know my tried and tested plugins. So it was almost a waste anyway because yeah, they were just taking up space. So. Yeah, I mean, delay units, I have maybe three three that I stick with. And then I have, you know, a few reverb plugins that I really like that I stick with um, for effect. Um, I've had my eye on the Lexicon bundle um, because I would love, I would love to have like a 90s sort of more digital Lexicon, uh, you know, the, the PCM kind of stuff, you know, from, mm-hmm. from the mid 90s. Um, I would love one of those. Um, I'm I'm kind of on a bit of an embargo on myself from buying plugins. I, I, the the most recent plugin I bought was the Vertigo VSM3 um, from Plugin Alliance, which is like a gorgeous harmonic distortion type yeah. thing. Um, and I was very impressed watching someone else use that plugin, and I was just like, okay. And there's the Black Friday sales coming up, so you know, I, I was oh, like, yes. oh, you know, I, I could, I'll take this for twenty seven ninety nine. <laughs> you know, if it's like a, yeah, yeah. And I would encourage people certainly, you know, if if you're thinking of buying certain plugins, buy them. Always wait for the sales. Yeah, because you do, you get them for a fraction of the of of the uh, the retail cost. Um, but I am in a phase right now of, of consolidating down. I'm going to try and just have six or seven synthesizer plugins, four reverbs, you know, three delay units, and uh, and uh, you know, stick with my other sort of oddball effects. Um, you know, just to to kind of make it work rather than having like a visual. Uh, uh, of all of these <laughs> things that are just taking up space and it does I mean I'm not a hoarder right I, I'm the kind of guy that if if I haven't worn a t-shirt that's in my wardrobe in over a year I'll give it to my local Goodwill because yeah, yep. I I have yeah. no right to keep a t-shirt or whatever a shirt for longer than a year and not wear it it's just it's it's insulting someone else should be wearing that and 
and I have that. I guess I'm mentally, I kind of have that ethos, especially with when it comes to, um, you know, making music and plugins. You know, less is more. Yeah. I mean, that is a principle which not a lot of people understand in an age right now where it's about more and having more and downloading more plugins and you know making your sample pack folder as bloated as possible and then you wonder why you're not creative even though you have all of these tools and things at your disposal and it's because you just don't know where to begin because there's so many yeah yeah exactly that um, and it is bloated and it is so accessible and Going back to what you said there about the, the Black Friday deals, another thing I've come to realize as well is if you're on their page and then you navigate away, if you're lucky, you might actually you, you'll get a code or something will pop up on screen with a percentage off to try and mm. get you back on. So listeners, also look out for that as well. If you find something you like, go to navigate away and you'll probably get a pop-up trying to keep you on the page. Mm. But no, I think what you said there about less is more is, is spot on. And through the interviews now that I've done, this is the 50, this is going to be the 55th episode of this podcast. And that that is a recurring theme now is... Um, I'm noticing now more and more producers are trying to refine their processes, w get rid of the, the, the chaff, get rid of all the unnecessary um, things that are stopping them from being creative and reducing the track count in their, in, their pro in their projects, reducing the amount of plugins they're using, and it's just making them more creative. Mm. And, and it, everything you said there sort of echoes the, the conversations that I've had numerous times with other, with other producers, which I think is fantastic. In an age where you say there, where you go online, and I think you're just bombarded with different different shiny objects. You know, you could be like a magpie. Oh, that looks good. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. That sample pack. That sample pack. And like you say, you could have the, all these bloated sample packs then. Um, so yeah, really, really fantastic advice for our listeners. One th we're going to wrap up shortly because yeah. I'm well aware of time here. But I've got three questions. Yeah. Notably, one of them isn't music related from from one of our listeners. All right. uh, but but two two of them are. The first one is from a band called Year of the Fool, who I've had on this podcast, and um, this is from Philip. And he says he uses a lot of your presets in Silent One, mm. um, and he says they're brilliant. And he also used your track Control as a mixing reference for their most recent track Company Line, mm. and. Um, and he says, if you listen closely, you can hear the Michael Oakley influence in their releases, which is fantastic. But um, his uh, two questions, really. Uh, the first one is, do you use presets from other artists? And do you use mix references for your tracks? I'm trying to think if I have any artist packs. I don't think I do. Um, not because... I I'm against it, but I just I don't think it's really anything that's ever particularly came up. I mean, certainly mm. I use uh, all of our power tools, which is uh, a sample pack uh, range on Splice, and in my opinion, is probably the greatest sample pack range that's ever happened. I mean, it, literally, those sample packs are phenomenal. I mean, they have everything that you could probably look for for retro pop, which is you know. Certainly my last album, Odyssey, was my attempt to do a more modern interpretation of my retro sound. Um, so it really, I, I used that. But presets, no, I, I tend to buy mostly, um, I mean, maybe I should give a little rundown of what I use, maybe just uh, as my synthesizer. So I, I use mm. Omnisphere and I use Luftrum's uh preset banks i've got those i love the factory library in omnisphere so i use the atmosphere library and uh, mostly that and i use the hardware library which is all the kind of vintage synth stuff i use nexus so i've got a lot of expansions for nexus um they've got a, a wealth of great quality expansions and the good thing with nexus is there's no faffing around you you know that it's a rompler you look for the presets that you want you can favourite those presets and then it's very quick to find something you're looking for, which is what I'm trying to do in my music. I also yep. use VPS Avenger. I think that's one of the best sounding synthesizers that you can possibly ever get your hands on. The quality of that is... It's a chef's kiss of a synthesizer. It's <laughs> uh, Same with Omnisphere. Omnisphere is at that level. But Omnisphere, VPS Avenger and Reveal Sound Spire is my holy trinity i mean i really think mm. and nexus i think nexus i know nexus sometimes gets knocked for being a rompler but it's a rompler i mean it is what it is it does what it does yeah, yeah. that's its function it's not trying to be you know um, a big modular synth like something like 
VPS Avenger. It's trying to, to give you quick sounds to get your productions happening. So I use that um, and I have a few expansions that I've purchased for VPS Avenger. Reveal Sound Spire is an interesting one because that's probably the only one where I've made my own sound sets. And I use those sound sets in my music. It's a strange one. I just I just fell in love with Reveal Sound Spire. Um, and I've done a few sound sets for that. I've done sound yeah. sets for Silent. Silent is phenomenal. I mean, in terms of a virtual analog, it sounds great. Great for bass sounds, great for lead sounds, great for arpeggio sort of sounds. And I actually used, um, I actually used Silent quite a lot on that track Control that uh, Philip is used as a reference and that, yeah. that was used quite a lot on that um, so those are the ones that I use but, in, but it's just to answer the question more directly I, I, I don't I don't have any like uh, like I guess well known musician artists that are making their own music that they have made sound sets I, 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 I don't think I have um, really to be honest it's more expansions that I've bought that are third party um, yeah. and it's more the sound designers are well known like people like Luftrum um, who I've done work for I've actually done some sound sets for him I've got a serum set that I just finished for him which is coming out next year um, cool. and uh, I've done a sound set for Silent and for Spire for him also um, it's like a shameless plug I should have a plug there <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah and uh, the second question about references um, absolutely I mean, I definitely have references for, um, like, you know, tracks that I'm working on. And they're not the same references each time. You know, each track that I do, I'll have different references um, yeah. that maybe are more in line with the energy and the mood of the mix. Yes. I mean, it's one thing listening to a mix because, you know, you like the way the drums are produced. Um, but then it's a completely different thing when just the overall composition of the mix has a certain uh, quality to it that you're trying to achieve, a, an ambience to it, or just a, a certain energy that, that you're looking to try and match that energy. Um, I definitely recommend that. I think it's it's also good to check the frequency bands of your mix. I mean, certainly there's been tracks where I've been doing the demos for and then I've listened to a reference and I've realised oh I've literally got no bass end on this mix of mine you know there's like, <laughs> like and, and you don't notice because it's maybe a very bright hi-fi sort of sounding mix and then you take it you know you, I, I'm old school I like to take my mix into the car and yep. listen in the car stereo same. because the car stereo doesn't lie and the same way um, you, I, I used to have like a little boombox and yep. uh, like, a, like a little old kind of radio and there's no low end on that radio it's a very mid heavy bright sort of thing and that doesn't lie because whatever transients come through loud and clear on that radio is what is the dominant features of the track so if you're like oh my goodness the, that snare drum is louder than the vocal the snare drum is louder than the vocal on your yeah. other speakers as well. I mean, it doesn't lie. Um, so, I mean, having references um, for mixes, you know, other artists that are maybe part of a playlist that you're using is crucial. But also have other mix reference sources that you're listening to your mix through. You know, yes. listen, yep. listen in your car stereo. That's a classic because um, everyone has one. And then listen to it on like a little crappy uh, radio. I mean, hell, even your iPhone, I mean, the iPhone has got no bottom end. Mm -hmm. So really you're getting to hear the high transients of, of the mix coming through. And that's great for you for listening to the presence of your vocal, listening to the presence of the hi-hats in, in your drums and the air of your drums. And also for things like certain airy synth sounds and things you're going to get an, a real true indication that it's I guess the word I would use is it's indiscriminate yeah. because you're hearing how it is not how you want it to be <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly yeah 
I, exactly. I think those are fantastic points what you mentioned there about not only using the, the, the mixed references but also different environments is key. Mm. And I know when I've worked with other, with other artists and I send them a mix or a master and say, make sure you listen to this in different environments at different levels mm -hmm. with fresh ears as well um, and I think that that's key well, that is key one other thing actually probably very crucial to, to probably add is consider the demographic of people that are listening to your music yeah. in the sense that people aren't going to be listening to it on a Denon high end system where you can hear the squeak from the drum pedal I mean that, those days <laughs> that's a very niche you know musician a, a connoisseur that likes to listen to music that way i mean most people who are listening to your music are probably listening to them on the the ear pods that they got with their iphone so yeah listen to your mix through ear pods that you get with like your you know your okay. iphone or your ipad and reference on that because that's what people are probably going to be listening to you know the, yep. they probably the, 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 you've got to think about what how will people be consuming your music and making sure that it also is m optimized for that yeah yeah exactly that you're, you're exactly right and i often see online i see posts of, of various people saying do xyz and i think it does boil down to that in that most people i mean when i walk down the street now i hear people and they'll be listening to music through their phone mm. um, and you, you do need to optimize it for that it's very true um so moving on to the the uh, the next question. Mm -hmm. This is from Carl on the On Highway, who's a is a massive um, supporter of the podcast. Nice. So his his, his question. This is uh, a really interesting one. So, what was the most valuable thing you learned from working with ninety synth mastermind John Campbell of the Time Frequency? Mm. Probably. I mean, I, I'm really good friends with John, so we have we have lots of conversations I, I usually get a call with him every month at some point yeah. you know we catch up but the biggest thing that I probably learned from John was that sometimes that you can lose sight of your audience and you can lose sight of how your audience sees you rather mm -hmm. than the way I think my audience would see me. So to give you the, a more s specific on that is that, so I, how I came to meet John and know John was, um, I had sent John a message on Facebook like five years ago and it took him like four years to get back to me. <laughs> he messaged me on Instagram and he said, hey, uh, I just got your message. And I was like, what message? And I wait a minute, from, from 2017? Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. And uh, and we started talking and then I, I sent him a version, like I'm, I had finished a mix of one of the tracks for my last album, Odyssey. And it was, is there anybody out there? And you can hear that version because that version is the B-side to mm -hmm. the main version that John did that became the album version and the single yes, version. Yeah. So if you, if you go on Spotify and you listen to, is there anybody out there? It was the 90s mix. That's my yeah. version. So if you were to swap the two versions out on the album, that would be, I guess, the original version I came up with and I sent John that version and it had shades of you know his music in that because you know I wanted this, the track to kind of have a little bit of that kind of mid 90s Euro dance kind of chicane Robert Miles feel oh wow yeah right? yeah and he liked it and he said you know this is really good and then he he said um I don't think this is right for you I don't think this is right for your audience. Um, and he said, I'm going to do a mix for you and I'm going to show you what I mean. And so, yeah. you know, I was kind of like, okay. And and it's funny because if anyone else had said that, I probably would have been like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> but because John said it, and I know John knows what he's talking about, I I actually went along with it more willingly and freely because I, because I trusted his judgment and I do trust his judgment um, 
you know, he's myself and him have very similar views about music and pop music and retro music and stuff, and even dance music. We have very similar taste and and ideas. And he sent me his version, which sounded it sounded more like me than it sounded like. <laughs> it sounded, it sounded, and he even he even said to me, he said, "Your version sounds like me. My version sounds like you." <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so funny because he was right and yeah, um, yeah. and it was a real I think that's maybe the biggest lesson from John is that John could see me and my I guess presentation of what my audience would want yeah. whereas at that point when I was doing Odyssey I was moving away from because intros, like if, I guess if I was to class my albums my first albums are very Synthwave on the nose album. It's very kind of futuristic, but John Hughes soundtrack sounding that sort of classic synthwave retro wave sort of sound. My second album was a move away from that because I wanted to do an authentic synth pop record that was like eighties. Because I grew up my my hero, the biggest hero of mine is Pet Shop Boys, and yeah. um, I grew up listening to that Pet Shop Boys, New Order, Depeche Mode. And I wanted to, you know, I felt I felt like everybody in the synthwave scene was doing the kind of same kind of sound, and I wanted to push to do something a little bit different because I knew I could do it. I knew I could do a, a really authentic synth pop record. So the introspect was that, with hints of mo- of that synthwave sound that I had sort of done before, and then Odyssey was a move into more of a kind of the kind of. A- AOR record that you would imagine Sting would make in the 80s or someone like Robert mm. Palmer would make um, like a 70s rock group front man that was going solo and, yeah, and, yeah. and doing a more kind of multifaceted synth pop type record that was my idea of what Odyssey would be I imagined because I wanted to also make it more modern sounding so it's it's, a, it's got a bit more of a kind of refined production style um, because I always like to try and do something a bit like something that will push me away from the temptation to go back and revisit. Because mm-hmm. um, that that I think that breeds complacency. So yeah, I I I guess because my mindset was in pushing to kind of do something that was a bit more of a a more serious singer songwriter type record that that had that a and a o r. Um, Sting meets Peter Gabriel meets um, Tears for Fears, I guess. And Blue Nile was a big influence. I'm a big Blue Nile fan. They're my favourite Glasgow synth pop band. Um, I wanted to have a big smack of that in there. Um, yeah. I think I, I know what John meant, that I had probably maybe pushed too far away and it might might not have resonated with my fan base and and my audience as as in the way that I hoped it would um if you know what I mean and it was kind of interesting yeah, to, yeah. to see the lesson that the way other people see you is uh, and and how they um what they come to expect from you the kind of boundary mm-hmm. lines if you push too far on those boundary lines left field it can do you more harm than good because it, it, it can alienate your audience. And I love, I, I mean, I, I love 90s dance music. I love stuff like The Beloved, Electronic, um, Chicane, Robert Miles, mm-hmm. mentioned them earlier. Um, and I love like Time Frequency, John's music. Yeah. I grew up with that. That was, that was what I grew up listening to. Um, and that Eurodance period of the 90s, like Hadaway, Too Unlimited, Snap, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, KLF, I mean, all of that stuff, I love that. And I think I could do a really, really great record like that. But the problem with that music is, is it's very difficult to do that type of music in a singer-songwriter based format because the lyrics of those types of tracks were very kind of... The lyrics were more of an afterthought. It was more happy-go-lucky. Uh, it yeah. was all about the chorus, and <clears throat> and you couldn't really tell a story. And, and and I like to tell a story, and I think that's where... Is there anybody out there? I love my version of it, 
but I, I think John was right. I think he, he was absolutely on the money that if I had went with my version, that it was maybe a little too left field for what my audience would appreciate. If, because yeah. because a lot of those nineties artists, when you you know I, I love them, but I don't think it's stood the test of time the way eighties music has. Yeah, and yeah, and I look at some of those artists, and I've got more Spotify plays than those artists, and it's kind of like what the f- <laughs> you know, like that's that is <laughs> not right, you know. Yeah. You're, and obviously the difference being at that time, they were selling records in an actual store like Tower Records or HMV, and it, and it was. It was a very different time. With they were uh, within the record industry, but still, though, it made me realise there's not quite the same nostalgia for that yeah. type of music that I maybe have. You know, it's it's probably very niche to me personally because I grew up with it. So yeah, I mean, that, I, I, to answer that question directly, that was the lesson that you know you have to be very careful sometimes that. If you push too far with the boundary lines of, of what you're trying to explore in your music as an artist, that's nice because we're you know we're all evolving, creative, trying to push, you know, to do something a little bit different to to maybe tickle our audience into, you know, seeing a different side of us. But push too far, and they will turn away from you. And I think that's that was probably the biggest lesson with that with John for sure. No, that's a, that's a great answer, and um, it's almost like you're describing sort of like a, a take stock moment where you suddenly, it, uh, for whatever way, a better way of putting it, sort of like putting you back in and saying, "Hold on a minute, just 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 rein it in a bit and just mm. just take stock of just take stock of where you are." Uh, Michael, final question here. Mm-hmm. Now, this is from this is from Emily. She's a, she's a um, an avid supporter of the podcast. Now, this is totally unmusic related, so I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go down. But she wants to know. She, she asked, I would like to know how your cats are, because um, I, I understand you're, you're, you're an avid cat fan. I have four cats. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we, have, we have four cats in here. Um, two boys, two girls. Um, most recently, we, we just got one six months ago. Um, yeah. She's just six months old, still a baby, a uh, little baby Ruby. Um, but yeah, I, I love my cats. Um, <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, I wonder if it's a replacement for not having children of my own, but I, I just never wanted to do that. I love animals. Yeah. But yeah, I, I absolutely adore my cats, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't have plans to get any more, to be honest. I know that, that uh, the four are rambunctious enough, but uh, yeah, it's a shame I'm, because got... that's the, 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 in the background you can see the cat bed. That's that's Dustin's. Is that what that's, that is? That's, that's Dustin's bed. He's, yeah. he's my co-producer. He, uh, he, let, he lets me know, you know, if, uh, yeah. if something's not going right in the mix. <laughs> I, I do something similar. I've, I've got one cat, and that, that is enough for me, the one cat, my girlfriend and I. And uh, I, he'll often be sat on his back behind me, and I kind of, like, judge. If he's on his back, like, looking up, and I, um, I, I try and judge that as to whether or not he likes the mix or not. I'm, I haven't quite worked it out yet, but, yeah, one cat's enough for me, mate. One cat's enough. Um, Michael, we're, we're, we're going to wrap it up here. I cannot thank you enough for your time today. Um, thank you. It's no, been fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, to thrash out and just and, and hear your experiences with music production and everything. And we, there, there's so much more we could have dived into, but um, it's been absolutely brilliant. For um, for our audience who, as I say at the beginning, may not have may not have come across your music before, um, where, where where is the best place for them to go online to find more about yourself and and your music? Oh, well, you, I'm on all digital platforms, uh, Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music. Um, I'm on all of those mm-hmm. platforms. Um, and follow me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I do have a TikTok, but I'm, nah. I kind of have a bit of a... I have a little bit of a, uh, a love-hate relationship with that platform. Yes. I actually haven't uploaded anything to the platform as yet, but I plan on uploading my music videos and and cool. uh, little documentaries that I've made about the making of my albums that I've done in the past and oh, you brilliant. know see uh, I, you know I'm, I, I kind of have a bit of a weird relationship with social media I kind of only like to post when I have something to say rather than a constant hey I farted yesterday just wanted to let you know <laughs> you know like I, don't, I just I, you know I just don't I don't really like to yeah, sort yeah. of use it as a, as a public information thing you know what I mean I think again, yeah, yeah. this is more 
So, so yeah, that's, that's really it. Fantastic. Um, well, what we'll do there is, uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, I've just realised I've got a podcast, uh, another one coming on shortly, and one of the guests from the next podcast has joined us. <laughs> All right, so might as well say hi while you're here. So I'm just chatting to Michael Oakley. Um, Hello. Feel free to say hi. <laughs> um, yeah, you enjoyed us a bit early. Um, but no, brilliant, Michael. Thank you so much. This is the first time that's ever happened. Um, thank you so much for this. And um, You're very welcome. Yeah, yeah no, anytime. It's, yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant. What would be great is maybe, because um, we didn't actually touch on any of the actual mixing side of things in, in terms of like starting a mix. I know we talked a bit about vocal production, but I think it'd be great to get you back on and, and chat about sort of like approaching the mix from the ground up. Um, I think that'd be great. Well, um, you know what, ne- next time why don't we, uh, we could, I'll get a session ready and uh, I'll share my screen and we can dive in and take a look at the, at the session and we can sort of go through each group and take a look yeah. at uh, how I've built it up and what, what and why I did what I did and, and we could do that. That would be quite fun. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. That'd be brilliant. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'll, I'll say a big thank you again and I'll catch up with you soon. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.